Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day to know and to serve your Son, our Lord, Jesus. And we ask you today to remind us of our calling, vocation, purpose in this world for your cause. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, today we'll continue our series on Kuiper's Stone Lectures. So last week, if you fell asleep in the lecture, or you happened to not be here, or you didn't catch the YouTube recording, last year we introduced the character Abraham Kuiper, who was the Prime Minister of the Netherlands at the turn of the 19th century. Uh, it's a name that us here at Canterbury are familiar with for many years. We have a Kuiper on our teaching staff. Right? Kuiper is uh, Abraham Kuiper, of course, being a figure both of religious identity, political identity, and also educational identity. For us to understand Abraham Kuyper, we have to understand that God's kingdom and God's people is more than just religious dogma. Meaning that God, when he calls his people, he doesn't call them to the four walls of the church. He doesn't call us to respectable worship, to proper vestments. He doesn't call us to special prayer books. He doesn't call us to sitting in pews. When God talks about religion, he doesn't confine religion to Sunday services. Now, of course, all of us would say yay and amen to that, but it's difficult. It's difficult for us to put our religion into the rest of the world. So I have in your bulletin some sermon notes with some quotes from his lectures that I'm going to work through here. I think it's helpful to have the lecture notes with you so that you don't just have to hold on to them in your mind as I read them. But for Kuiper, placing God at the center of the Christian life undermines many of the religious errors of man. So to place God at the center of the life undermines a lot of our religious errors. Now, we're a tradition that has bishops, and priests, we have clergy, we have institutions, we have diocesan conventions, we have cathedrals, we have, as an institution, traditions, we have textbooks, we have seminaries, we have lots of layers of religion, lots of layers of our truth, and many of it is meant to protect doctrinal integrity. Right? If I was to say, what does it mean for you to be a good Christian? You could easily point out to some of these layers of religious identity that protect what it means to be a Christian. Right? Well, we believe in the doctrines of grace. We believe in the Reformation. We trust our bishops. We trust our priests. We trust the liturgy. We recognize that these religious pieces stand between the God of the Bible and us. And in our mind, these protect who God is. But what Kuiper says is that if we take God and we place him at the center of our life, it's a threat to many of these institutions. Now, let's use an example that all of us are comfortable with. There's bad bishops out there, right? There's bishops out there who are not godly. There are bishops out there who do not uphold the Bible. There are bishops out there in history, and even today, there are bishops out there who are, as we might say, against God, antichrist bishops. And so it'd be easy for us to say that these antichrist bishops and their religious errors are undermined if we take God at the center. How do we judge by which these bishops are bad? By looking at God's word, what God expects, who God is. So Kuiper is making this same comment. The closer we get to who God is, the more we study the Bible, the closer we experience God, the more pure our repentance is. If we make God the center, there is a danger there. The danger is that God being close threatens our institutions of comfort. Meaning that the things that we trust are supposed to work in a certain way are often at odds with God. This is why our Lord can say things like, he who does not hate his mother and father and serve me, right? how can our Lord say that? The same one who says, honor your father and your mother. How can our Lord, seeing people weep over the dead, say, let the dead bury the dead? When our Lord knows we love our loved ones. We go to their graves. We remember their legacy. We put flowers 
for the dead. We have ceremonies and celebrations and memorials. Yet our Lord says, let the dead bury the dead. You see, for Kuiper, and hopefully for all Christians, the closer we get to God, the more God threats the little altars and idols that struggle for God's attention in our life. Now, one of the things that I would like to point out to you this morning is that this is especially true day to day. You ever find yourself struggling to fit everything into your day? I don't have enough time to read new books. I don't have enough time to take care of my children. I don't have enough time to cook dinner. I don't have enough time to visit with my friends. I don't have enough time to go and visit with relatives. I don't have enough time to study my Bible. We're all very, very, the big word is busy. We're all busy. And so when we come to church and I say, be more religious, be more Christian, do more godly things, place God at the center of your life, can you imagine how difficult it might be if I put an actual time block in your life for you to put God in your center? If I said, give me one hour every day, seven days a week where you put God at the center, what is it going to push out? What in your life might be attacked if I said, of the 24 hours in your day, you take eight away, you're sleeping of the remaining 16 hours, give me one where you stay in your prayer closet or you stay in front of your Bible. Could you do it? Maybe some of you already do. You guys deserve a little pat on the back, a little crown in heaven, a little heavenly surprise. But I'm sure that most of us don't have that hour carved out. Now, it's not my job and it's not my responsibility to assign that hour, but I want you to think about if in your day, I put an hour into your schedule. Some of you use a Google Calendar. Some of you have a little uh, daily calendar. Some of you keep it in track in your mind. If I took an hour and I forced it into your calendar, what would be pushed out? What would be squished? Who would be removed? For some of us, we might say, we don't have to watch Netflix now. Some of us might say, I won't have time for my job now. I won't have time to answer these emails. Some of us might say, I won't have time for soccer practice or Chinese school. This intervention into your calendar would reveal that many of the things that are good for us, religious errors, by placing God in the center, God points out that what sometimes we mean for good undermine what God has in store for us. Another way Kuiper writes this, and this is in your bulletin notes here, page 48 of the Lectures on Calvinism, Kuiper writes, Religion for the sake of man carries with it the position that man has to act as a mediator for his fellow man. I get to find some terms. What's a mediator? Mediator is an important word. I want you to think of lawyer. I want you to think of judge. I want you to think of intercessor. Mediator is somebody who stands between Mediator. Through our great prayer in the prayer book service, we say we have one advocate, one mediator, our Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, the way this church is formed, the way our hierarchy is structured, the way that the people up front dress, the way that we organize Sunday, sometimes gives you the false idea that you have another mediator. Even the title. Sometimes people call me... Father Steve. Sometimes they say on my business card, I'm a presbyter or priest. That somehow that would give the illusion that when I stand between you and the altar, I'm a mediator. Not so. There is no mediator between God and man. The reality is each and every one of us not only have direct access to God through our prayers, for our worship, through the scripture, but each and every one of us have direct responsibility to God because there is no mediator. The reason why we love religion, why we love busyness, why we love distraction, why we love filling our calendars, why we love having friends, why we love having families, why we love having jobs, vocations, responsibilities, the reason why we love it is this buffer that our culture, our society creates, allows us to mediate our life between us and God. We'll start with religion. 
Your priest is going to do a good job for you today, right? He's going to tell you what you need to hear. He's going to offer the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving in the form of Holy Communion. He's going to make sure you hear the scripture. He's going to give you a handshake. He might give you a blessing. The priest is going to make you feel better about your week this week. Encourage you, send you on your way, a little bit smarter, a little bit wiser, a little bit more happy, hopefully. He's going to be a mediator. That's what we think. He's going to do his job, make my soul a little bit healthier, make my mind a little bit hardier, make my life a little bit better. But we look for mediators not just in religion. I think we look for mediators throughout our day. I'll tell you about my favorite mediator. When I'm a little bit bored or I want to procrastinate, the best mediator is Taco Bell. You can kill 30 minutes going to the drive-thru, and at the end of the drive-thru, you get that instant satisfaction of whatever you wanted, you got to speak it through the box, and magically, you give them your card through the window, comes out Chalupa, Burrito Supreme, Nacho Supreme, Nacho Bell Grande, and a big gallon-sized vat of Mountain Dew Baja Blast. And for that 30 minutes, that 40 minutes, as I am consuming, I'm not bored, I'm not procrastinating, I'm eating and enjoying, I'm happy, I'm satisfied, I'm full, my taste buds are enlivened. I have put a mediator between all of the stresses of my life, all of the difficulties of my endeavors, between me and God. Maybe I'm supposed to be working on a sermon or writing a paycheck or working out the accounting or maybe I'm supposed to be spending time with my kids or maybe I'm supposed to be doing chores around the house or maybe I have a paper I haven't finished. Whatever it is that I'm supposed to be doing, I can find something to put between me and my responsibility and mediate my laziness, my busyness, my procrastination through things. It's our nature to do it. But we look for mediators in lots of institutions. What will really make me happy, we say, is if I find the right spouse. If I find the right husband or the right wife, then I'll be satisfied. What will really make me happy is if I could fix my husband or my spouse, if they would give up their sinful behavior and understand the program. We look for our personal peace, affluence, happiness, mediated through relationships. You ever notice that broken people look for people around them to fix them? It's natural. When you get bad news, when you're fired from a job, when the medical report comes back bad, when you're stressed or strained, when you're behind on your classwork, when you're behind on your bills, when you're behind on your accounts, when you're behind in this world, you look for other people to give you comfort, strength, encouragement, help. You just want them to even have empathy, hear your problems, and listen to you complain. You ever have a bad day and just call a friend and have them listen to you? They're mediating your suffering, your pain. Notice, it's our natural human endeavor to look for mediators, people to hold our burdens. And religion does the same thing. Who can I get to hold my burden on Sunday? What doctrine, what fancy piece of bread, what sip of wine could I get to hold my burden? Now, Kuiper says that though we all do this, we all look for things to mediate our sin, our, our suffering. Religion for the sake of God, meaning when we come to Christianity and make God the center of it, it inexorably excludes every human mediatorship. What does that mean? It means that in God-centered Christianity, the source of your happiness is not in your wife. The source of your happiness is not in your stomach. The source of your happiness is not in sex. The source of, the source of happiness is not in Taco Bell. The source of happiness is not found in this world. God-centered Christianity says that the source of contentment, peace, purpose, and fullness is found outside of this world, and nothing in this world will bring you to what Christ has for you. Now, some of us might think that that's a lot of sky, 
cloud, wishful thinking, and that Kuiper might be some kind of weird New Age mystic. He says, forget the cares of this world, focus on God. But he says it for the exact opposite reason. If you go to this world to find contentment, you'll never find God in this world. But if you go the other direction, if you go to God for contentment, God will bring himself into this world and its troubles. That's why when we're sick, we pray for God to heal. That's why when we're sick, we pray for God to comfort. That's why when we're hungry, we pray and give thanks to God before we eat. That's why when we get married, we ask God to bring us together in marriage before consummation. We bring God in first, and God blesses, creates, and mediates every human institution. I always tease the kids here. If you don't pray before you eat, you eat without pray over food, eat without grace, you get a stomachache. There's a little bit of truth to that. You start to develop a sense of entitlement, that you're the one that got that food. You're the one who doesn't need to give thanks. You're going to develop a spiritual stomach. But it's not just about giving thanks. It's about recognizing where goodness, peace, and affluence comes from. My generation, and even me as a teenager, struggled with contentment in relationship and struggled with the order of God in relationships. You know, there's a special order that God has. Boy meets girl, right? Girl likes boy. Boy asks girl for... Uh, boy asks girl's parents for marriage. Boy and girl get married. Then boy and girl have children. Goes in that order. But we like to move, move around in a different order. We like to take God's order and put it in a different direction. Instead of waiting until marriage, we live in a generation that moves intimacy to whenever it feels good. Whenever we feel like it. Whenever we want to express love. What's the consequence? We get a tummy ache. We experience heartbreak. We experience difficulty. We experience separation from God. We experience anxiety. We experience struggle. Struggle, difficulty. But it's true in every place where we try to make this world our mediator. Now, here in your notes on page 8, I have another quote from Kaifer that moves on to the priestly intervention. It says, Only where all priestly intervention disappears where God's sovereign election from all eternity binds the inward soul directly to God himself, and where the ray of divine light enters straightway into the depth of our heart, only there does religion, in its most absolute sense, gain its ideal realization. Now, hear what Kuiper is saying this morning. God's sovereign Another way to say this, taking all of the language of the theology out of it, just say God's plan. It's like that Drake song, right? God's plan. <coughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. Other people are thinking. Who's Drake? Only Enoch knows. Just kidding, Drake. God's plan and man's desire. See, priestly intervention is not about idolatry. Priestly intervention is not about the idea that somehow we're not good enough and so we need an expert. Priestly intervention is about us not trusting that God has a plan, a purpose, and a blessing for where our life is going. We interpose, we put ourselves as the mediator, we try to put it in our own way, our own path, our own plans, because ultimately we don't trust God's plan. If we go back to the example... Steve Macias at 17 years old. Why does he behave the way he does? Because he doesn't think God's right about the blessings of marriage. He doesn't think it's going to destroy the relationship to introduce intimacy before. He doesn't think it's going to dishonor God. He doesn't think anyone's going to find out. He doesn't think that God's plan is the only way. And so he puts in his own intervention. The same thing is true for us. Total reliance on God is what we mean when we say faith in God. It means trusting in God's plan now 
and also trusting that in the future, God will work it out for the good, as we read in Romans 8. Trusting in God's election and providence is not about who's going to get to heaven. It's about when God works out in this world the best for his people, it doesn't depend on how smart I am, how rich I am, how much work I do. It depends on God's plan and how much I can trust that. And yet we're so tempted to create against God's plan our own to go around his rules, to go around his standards, to go against his laws, to try to subvert his purposes, to try to ignore his worship, to try to get to dinner without grace, get to marriage without commitment, get to God without him. So Kuiper talks about this idea of religion. And all of us have either a God-centered religion or a man-centered religion. Either our prosperity and our future and our hope and our peace is based in God's plan for us or our own efforts. Now look back. How many years have you been here? 10, 20, 30, 70, 80? Some of you a little bit more? Could you have planned it this way? Think about all the times that God stepped in against what you wanted, against what you had planned. God stepped in and said, no, you're going this way. Think of all the times you desperately wanted God to take you the way you had planned, and he said, not this time. This time, we're going to follow my plan. And look at where you're at today. And you look back at those places, those decisions, those turns, those paths. Would you go back and say God was wrong? God led me the wrong path? God made a mistake. Would you go back and say, Lord, here and here and here, I told you I was right, you were wrong, let's go back and do it again. Could you do it? Would you do it? No. We look back and we see God had our back. God had our best in mind. God was protecting us. God had a purpose. God had a meaning. Even the tough, even those times when we were sick, even those times when God took our loved ones away, even those times we were suffering, even those times when we were poor, even those times when we were ridiculed, even those times that were difficult, even those, we don't want to go back and get rid of them. We know God used them for us. It was God's plan. God used those difficulties to grow you into the man you are, to grow you into the woman you are, to develop the character you have, to teach you what you needed to know, to give you the people in your life, to develop the children you have, to give you the job skills you needed, to give you the vocational know-how. That's why this morning in our epistle lesson, St. Paul makes a big deal out of one. There's one plan. God's in charge. And though we kick and fight and scream and cry and beg God to go the other direction, God says that there is one path, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is one elected path, one means of salvation. Our Lord says that there is one gate, there is one road. It's narrow, and our Lord leads us down this one way. And our job is to find our way to that one place, stay there. On the Lord's way. Not on the path of man-centered religion. Kuiper looks to salvation. That is rescue. That is redemption. And he says that salvation as a work of God will be a complete and total work. And here I want you to move away from the idea that salvation is your ticket to heaven. Because salvation in Kuiper's mind is what the Bible says salvation is. Not what our Sunday school teacher told us one day when we memorized John 3.16. Salvation is the rescuing of us from sin. Salvation is the rescuing of creation from the curse. Salvation is the reign and rule of King Jesus over earth. Salvation is the power of the Holy Spirit to allow us to rule as vice regents with Christ on earth. Salvation is the power of God in earth. Just like our Lord prayer. When you pray, pray like this. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. That is, salvation come on earth as it is in heaven. So Kuiper took this vision of heaven invading earth, took this vision of salvation as a complete and total work, and he says, and this is in your notes here, to be sure, many branches and leaves fell off the tree of the human race, but yet the tree itself shall be saved. So many of us focus on who's getting in the door and who's coming off the door. Kuiper said that's like the tree with all of its leaves. We're going to argue about who's saved on the tree, but that's not what salvation, or who's the leaf on the tree, but that's not what salvation is about. Salvation is Christ giving us life to a dead tree. Kuiper writes, Yet the tree itself shall be saved on its new root in Christ, and it shall once more blossom gloriously. See, the picture is of earth like a tree. From Adam down, earth in its entropy, earth in its destruction, earth in its sin, is winding down in curse and death and destruction. But Christ replants the tree of life. Christ gives us a new earth, new creation, and new life. That humankind itself, earth itself, the cosmos themselves, might be born again. Kuiper writes, For regeneration does not save a few isolated individuals. Sometimes we limit, it. We limit uh, Calvinism to be that. And this is a lecture on Calvinism, right? Isn't that what election means? God saves a few chosen people? It's only half of the story. Regeneration does not save a few isolated individuals finally to be joined together mechanically as an aggregate heap. Regeneration saves the organism itself, our race. Now, Kuiper is not saying that all people are going to go to heaven. What he's saying is that we don't save a few people and rescue them out of this world to the next. Instead, we save the entire person for their purpose and vocation. We save every person for their purpose in this world. You're suffering because you're sick and in disease, but God saves your body to make it healthy again. You're suffering because you don't know and you're ignorant, and God saves the person and gives them wisdom. You're suffering because you break God's laws, you go against his commandments, you commit these sins, but God saves the person. He gives them strength to uphold follow and keep his commandments. He saves you for this world, not from it. The purpose of salvation is that you might own your life in this world following Christ. The nature of salvation is that the Christian now reigns in this life. And finally, our last point this morning. Kuiper says this about the Christian. This is the last note there on page 8. He feels, rather, his high calling to push the development of this world to an even higher stage. Many of us behave as though we're on a life raft. Just hold it out. Paddling along, eating the rations, drinking the leftover water from our canteen, waiting for the Lord to return and rescue us from the life raft. And we stay there praying every day, Lord, come quickly, come quickly. But the Christian isn't on a life raft. The Christian says, Jesus came, he saw, he conquered. He conquered the world, sin, and Satan. He conquered the powers of this world. He conquered the sin of this world. He came to make us more. He came to make us victorious. He came to make us conquer. So we're not on the life raft. Instead, we're in a world that we're going to develop. We're going to push every area of life to its next stage of development. Kuiper continues. And to do this in constant accordance with God's ordinance, for the sake of God, upholding in the midst of such a painful corruption everything that is honorable, lovely, and it's good report among men. 
See, in the Kuiperian worldview, we start with you as this individual. You stand before God directly. Both access to him and judgment from him. And he has something wonderful to say about you. For you, I have sent my son to cover the cost of your sins so that you may live as I intended. Now we miss that a lot in Christianity. We tell the beginning of the story. We say, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that all who believe in him should have eternal life. But that becomes the whole story. We accept eternal life, but are never beginning our eternal life. Kuiper says, eternal life begins now. Those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ are living forever now. Those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ have the power of Christ now. We have the power to overcome sin now. We have God with us now. We have the strength of God now. We have eternal life here. But what are we going to do with it? This is where Kuiper says you take the individual who's given a new heart, who's given new life, who has his sin washed away, and he's going to pursue everything that is honorable, lovely, and good report. We're going to develop that character of who we are. We're going to keep the promises we make to God, keep the promises we make to ourselves, living honorable, lovely, even though the world around us does not worship our God, we will. Even though the world around us is not honoring our God, we will. Even though we go to Taco Bell and nobody else says their grace above their breed of supreme, we will. Bow our heads and give God thanks. Even though everyone on every college campus believes sex before marriage is okay, we won't. Even though everyone in this world thinks it's okay to live off debt, and credit cards. We won't. Even though everybody thinks it's okay to dishonor marriage, we won't. Because we believe that the kingdom of God is with us now. And that God's purpose and his plan involves everything that you are in it. Another way to describe this is that God's plan needs you. God's plan requires you. But not just any version of you. Who you are today is not good enough for who God needs to fill his plan. So God's going to take you, and he's going to shake you around, and he's going to call you to become something more. And sometimes when God's shaking you, it's going to hurt. Sometimes when God's shaking you, it's going to be painful. Sometimes you're going to say, God, give me some comfort. But the world was made by God to glorify him. And it was made with God's plan that involved you and the version of you God created you to be. And if we get stuck in man-made religion, if we get stuck trying to mediate between ourselves and God, trying to put our plans before God, we're preventing God from creating in us the kind of person that God needs. So this is my call. Sometimes I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over and over again. But it begins with acknowledging where we've fallen short, where we've sinned, where we've broken people's trust, where we have broken God's commandments, where we have not lived purely, honorably, lovely, where there's not a good report in our life. And it involves us putting those things before the Lord. Because he sees them already. He knows our failures, our shortcomings already. We put them before him. He washes them. And today, he invites you having been forgiven, to live for him, to become more like him, to put all things under subjection for his purposes. But this morning I want you to hear 
that as St. Paul describes our vocations, our purposes and our callings, God and his plan needs what you're offering. Not because he can't do it without you, but because his plan involves you. His plan is for your benefit. His plan is based on his love for what you will get out of becoming the person he's called you to be. Remember, God's not this punitive God in heaven who is punishing us until we obey his law. No. His law, his standards, his purity, his excellence is growing us into what will best be for us. So, as Kuiper said, let's seek out everything that is honorable, lovely, and good report among men. Just as our Lord calls us to be his servants, his fishers of men, his children, his heirs, his vice regents, those who will serve at his right and his left, those who will dwell in his new heavens, those who will dwell in his new earth, those who will contain themselves as the very temples of the Holy Spirit. The God of our scripture works in us, not just religion. Let us pray. <clears throat> oh Lord, our Father, we ask you to reveal in our hearts a sense of our calling before you. Lord, you call us in all of our roles, parents and children, and professionals, husbands and wives. Lord, remind us that all of our jobs, all of our gifts, all of our skills, all of our time are part of your plan. Help us to see ourselves in your plan and to trust in you as you work out all things for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, how he says, more blessed to give than to receive. Our offer a hymn this morning is Judge Eternal, Throned in Splendor. Thank you.